so it's kind of visible, good. So open that example project. And it, it's annoying that the, uh, the monitor cable isn't long enough for me to sit at the part of the bench that doesn't, that has somewhere for me to put my knees. Um, Did anyone work out what was wrong with this this code? I'll actually stick. Someone asked me to stick this this uh, script up on the uh, up on the web page. I'll do that after class today. Um, so that should so that was the code. Did anyone work out why it wasn't working? Oops, unknown identifier axis. Oh, that's not good. Okay, let's go back there. Unknown identifier axis. Oh, we've haven't. Oh, I removed. How did that happen? Save that. Let's try that again. Operation star cannot be used for left hand side of type vector and right hand side of type quaternion. Oh, okay. This is. Oh, aha. Uh -huh. So the, problem, the reason why I wasn't doing anything last time is there were bugs in our code. Um, when, uh, when you try to run a script, um, if Unity, um, if, you, if you enter a script that has errors in it and then try to run the scene in Unity, Unity will generally run the old version of the script um, that didn't have any errors in it, which can be really frustrating because you're going, why is it not doing anything? And the reason it's not doing anything is because Unity hasn't added your new script in because it wasn't working. So, um, so it just decided to continue with the old script, um, which is probably why it wasn't working last time. So I think I told you a lie last time when I said that you could mult to, uh, to rotate so, uh, um, a vector you could multiply by a quaternion. You have to multiply the other way around. The quaternion has to be first and the vector has to be second. And if you don't do that, it'll give you an error message. So let's see. And now we've got another error. No appropriate version of rotate for argument list float unity engine vector three. So we'll have to have a look. Um, if we go help scripting manual, go back up here to this, and we see what that method was. It was called rotate. I'm sure it was there. Transform rotate. Ah, OK. No, yeah. I'm sure there was a version where I said, ah, so it's axis angle, not angle axis. Um, so that was why that wasn't working. So if we come back down here, I put angle axis, it's actually axis angle. So we tell it the axis first, and then the angle. And is it like that? There's inconsistent line endings. Well, that's nothing very interesting. OK, and stop playing that. Now let's see if this actually works. Oh, that didn't work at all. What happened there? Let's take the camera. Actually, let's just uh, let's just watch this from the scene. So let's. So handy way to uh, debug in Unity is to put the pause button on first and then play the scene. Um, then it just then you can um, change back to the scene view and you can step through seeing what your code is doing. So our code seems to be, uh, oh, I see what's happening. Um, because we're rotating the ball and the camera is attached to the ball, we're rotating the camera at the same time. Um, so if you, uh, that's, that's a nasty trick. Um, so if you looked at it from, um, from the side, if we go back to the beginning, go back to this view, you can see as we step through, the camera is actually rotating with the ball. Um, which is not what we wanted. So we um, might have to undo that. We'll go back to the original situation we had where the camera wasn't attached to the ball. So we take the camera, we'll unattach it, and just stick it back in there. Uh, and we'll move it up a bit so that we can see things. Does that show us enough of the field? Maybe a bit more. Oh, that'll be enough. OK, let's see how that works. There we go, and now our ball, if you can, if you can see it, it's actually rotating as we, as we move. Um, and it's rotating in the right axis, it's, so it's rotating. And now if we put the, uh, if we put this object somewhere else, just to prove that it does work no matter where we put the object, 
it now rolls off in that direction instead, which is nice. So that's what we were trying to do. Um, so yes, that's, a, that's an easy mistake to make. I've done that many times where I've had an error in my code and I haven't noticed that Unity was reporting an error. Normally they appear down the bottom of the screen here, um, this little line across the bottom of the screen. Um, if you don't notice they're there and just try to run your code, it'll um, just run the old version of your code, the last version that worked, um, which probably doesn't do what you're expecting it to do. So that's kind of annoying, but you know, that's what Unity does. Cool, all right, so moving on from uh, that, we'll actually go and, um, well, we'll open another scene. We'll go start. What I want to talk, step away from coding for a little moment and talk um, today a little bit about designing and prototyping. I'm going to put my microphone on so that you can actually hear me over in video land. Um, well, that's, that's there, there we go. Um, so today we're going to be talking about design and prototyping. Oh, and by the way, just a note on the videos, we've had some uh, interesting technical hiccups with the videos, so um, I wouldn't rely on them for necessarily getting you everything, ev all the content of the uh, lecture in the videos. I think the, uh, the last couple of minutes of, yesterday, of Monday's lecture has no sound, uh, I believe, so, um, so you get the mimed version of that. Um, so, you know, it's always good to actually come along to class so you can really hear what I'm saying. Um, you know, it's a lottery. It's, it just makes you, you know. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about the process of how you go about designing and prototyping your code. And what I'm going to do over the next couple of lectures, I'm going to work through an example um, of, of a game and show you incrementally how I, go, how I go about building it. And as I introduce new concepts uh, along the way, I'll, we'll discuss them in more detail, so how, how you use them. Um, so we're going to, going to do at the game Asteroids. Um, uh, the, you know, who's played Asteroids? Uh, it's too, uh, some of you, it's too, it's too old now. I remember playing Asteroids way back in the day. One of my friends has an, um, has an Asteroids, an original Asteroids arcade box in his office. And like when you power it up, it sounds like it's going to explode or something. It's just, it has this great hum to it. Anyway, but I digress. But Asteroids is a very simple game, and so I'm going to just show you basically how you go about implementing it. But the, um, the key idea that I want to get across is this, going to be this idea of rapid prototyping, which is one technique of programming. Um, so we talked previously about the six stages of programming, where you work out what the requirements are, you write a specification, you build a design, you implement that design, you then test it, and you find problems, and you debug the problems. And uh, it would be nice to think that you could do that in those six stages, um, just you know, one by one. But the reality is that, um, that it doesn't work that way. Um, you get to the end, you, 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 implement, you design and implement something, you test it, and then you find out that, well, really your specifications were wrong and that the user didn't want that, they wanted something else. Um, and so, so that, that's called the traditional waterfall approach where you just do each step follows on from the previous. Um, in practice, it turns out to be um, very difficult. And if you're doing any real programming, you'll find by the time you've made something um, and run it and shown it to whoever you're meant to be showing it to, they will, they will say, oh, that isn't what I wanted. What I actually wanted was something else. And so if you spend several years building and polishing everything in detail uh, before you show it back to your client, you'll inevitably waste several years because they'll have wanted something different. Um, so the alternative is what's called the spiral model, um, which is a re repeated process of, um, of identifying objectives, identifying, uh, so you determine your objectives, you identify the risks, you prototype in order to test those risks, and then you evaluate and test and go around again. So, excuse me, so the idea is that you build, rather than building in the entire system before you test it, you build lots of small components that just test some of the mo most important things that you want to know about, about what the system should be, and then you actually go out there and test them. So, I mean, I use this primarily in game design. In game design, it's, it's very easy to, uh, to waste several years if you just spend all your time building a polished game before you bring it out to the players to see what they want. So, what you'll do in games is, is very early on, you'll build a prototype 
type of your game that um, that's really rough and ready and doesn't have any of the pretty artwork or anything, um, but is playable. And so you can see whether the game is kind of fun even in its early stages before you start building lots of models and beautiful worlds and intricate graphics and whatever. Um, so. Uh, and it's really valuable. Some of the earliest stages of prototyping we do is actually paper prototyping, where we make a board game version of, of our computer game, and we play that first and see if, we have, if that's fun, before we've even written a line of code. Um, and so, and, but in general, it's not just something you do for games, it's something you do for any, any er useful for any area of programming, where you need to work out what, what are the, uh, what's the biggest issues in this, in this program that I'm going to write. How can I prototype those, something, a solution to those issues and then test it to see whether it's going to do what I want it to do? Um, so the first earliest kind of prototype that you'll be doing in, in this class um, is actually before you even get on to doing software is to do storyboarding. Um, this is pretty much like the same process that, get, that happens in film. Um, an early treatment of a film will, will just be almost like a comic book, a rendering, a, a bunch of screenshots from what the scene will, what the first scene will look like, what the second scene will look like, and so forth. And each each shot will be a, um, an image of the scene, and then a, and a description of the action in that scene. And we're doing the same sort of thing in our programs: is to do um, typical use cases of our programs. So say this is how somebody would interact with our program here, and we show in a, just a sort of a comic book form what it will look like and what the key interactions are in our, co in our program. So I'm going to start with prototyping, um, prototyping asteroids. Oh, my asteroids are invisible. I should have chosen a different color asteroid. Um, the, uh, so the storyboard for astero asteroids is basically we have a ship uh, which will start in the middle of the screen uh, and we have a couple of asteroids which start at random starting positions in the world. Um, I'm not going to change. And then, so we say that the asteroids, each of the asteroids has a random um, direction that it moves in and it moves uh, continuously in that direction. Um, we can control the ship. We're going to use the up arrow on the keyboard to accelerate the ship and so that starts the ship moving forwards. We can use the down arrow to put on the brakes which stops us from moving. And uh, I shouldn't, I actually should have probably have noted here that this is acceleration not speed and so what we actually want eventually is for the for the ship to we, we press up arrow to accelerate we release the key and the ship keeps drifting until we put on the brake um, so we can press the down arrow to brake we can turn the ship left and rotate the ship left and right using the arrow, um, using left and right arrow keys and we can see here our asteroids have been moving along you can't see them, but our asteroids have been moving along here, and this asteroid has just got to the top of the screen, and so we're going to say that asteroids, when we get to the top of the screen, an asteroid's going to wrap around, so it's now there um, at the bottom of the screen, and the same thing will happen when they wrap left to right on the screen. Um, we're going to use the space bar to fire bullets. Um, if the bullet hits the asteroid, which is there, then the asteroid's going to split up into three smaller asteroids, which will all go off in random directions. If we shoot a smaller asteroid and we hit it, which is one there, then they're going to, it's just going to be destroyed. And if an asteroid hits the ship, there's an asteroid there colliding with the ship, um, we're going to have fiery death, and that will be the end of our game. Um, so that's essentially maybe a game over. Um, so that's essentially a, a storyboard for our game. It shows all the important interactions that are going to happen in our game, or at least in one level of our game. Now, um, we haven't really shown what happens when you, when you destroy all the asteroids. I'm going to, for the time being, just assume that, well, nothing much happens. You end up in empty space and, yeah. You, um, obviously, if you were making a real game out of this, you'd talk about how you'd go through an extra, how levels would advance, how you'd gain score, how you'd lose men, whatever else would happen in this game, but I'm going to keep it fairly simple for starters. So that's our first or our zeroth prototype, is, um, is actually just storyboarding the interactions. And if we were doing game design, I would, uh, and this was a novel idea and not just some game that everyone's played for, for ages, um, 
I would then actually take this, this design to, to some members of my target audience and ask them to evaluate it and whether they thought this looked like an interesting mechanic for a, for a game. Um, or probably, probably in a real game design, this would end up being a pitch document that I would take to my publishers and say, I've got this great idea for a game, um, it works like this, and I'd be able to show them, before having implemented anything, I'd be able to show them a bit of what the gameplay looks like. And I'd probably also talk up about how wonderful and exciting this game would be and revolutionary in terms of all the wonderful things it does, but, you know, that's not really important right now. Um, but that's our first prototype. So it gives us um, some idea of what the game's going to look like and an ability to test those ideas uh, without having written anything. And if, if it turns out that some of those ideas are not, <coughs> are not going to be interesting, then you know, we, can, uh, we can change them around on paper before they ever become anything. Um, notice we haven't really designed every last detail at this stage. Um, Part of, so that it's going to be an ongoing design process as well. As we spiral around, we're going to design solutions to, to how some of those things have worked. But we've identified what the key problems are. And so now, we can, having evaluated that, we say, well, what's the next biggest problem that we're going to have to deal with? And so the, uh, the next thing I, want, I think is going to be important is working out how do we handle the flight of the, uh, of the how do we handle controlling the player? Um, because getting the player control right even without any asteroids on the screen is probably going to be the most important thing to work out next. Um, so our second prototype then, our second iteration on, on the prototyping process would be to prototype the flight. And our goals of this, this prototype are to implement spaceship control using the arrow keys to speed up, slow down and turn and implement this wraparound at screen boundaries. Um, and those, those are the issues that we're going to deal with now. So, here are our tasks. We're going to make a ship, we're going to make it move, we're going to make it wrap around at the screen boundaries, and, we're going, and then we're going to add keyboard control. Um, let's start on that. So, let's go to Unity and show, show how this would work. Whoops. Right. Okay. Uh, press that. That. That's what I want. So, uh, let's start a new project. New project. And we'll call it, uh, not there, we'll start it in dum -dum 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 -dum, Unity. Oh, we actually already have, I'll call it New Ast Asteroids 2, because I already have an Asteroids project there that I was working on before. It's one I prepared before the show. Um, but you're probably all too young to know the Curiosity show, so that joke won't make it mean anything to you. Uh, yes, I'll save the changes to that. I'll come back here, wait for Unity to restart. It's really annoying how it has to sort of restart itself all over again when you create a new project. But hopefully that won't take too long. What are you doing, Unity? Why are you... No, oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, we... oh, I said to import the standard assets. That's annoying. <coughs> the standard assets usually aren't very useful. Um, unless you're making something very specific that needs grass and palm trees, um, you know, you don't really need the standard assets. I should have said no. This is going to take a little while. Ah, here we are. Okay. In fact, oh, I imported the pro standard assets as well. Well, you don't need any of that. Um, so, so, for starters, let's um, set up our scene. So let's have a, um, let's create some space. So the first thing to note is that space normally looks blue, that's kind of dull. So we can come to the camera, select the camera. Why is the inspector not working? Hello? That's weird, why is this not, why is it not showing me the camera in the inspector? Hello? That's strange. Let's try. Oh, oh, I'm, so no, Unity hasn't. What? Oh, my computer is. There we go. Okay, Unity. That's better. I wonder what happened there. Something strange. Okay, so the first thing to do is we can uh, the background color since it's space, we'll make it black. Um, so we just clicked on the background color there and select select black in the color picker. So now our game there is the black depths of space. It's beautiful. Um, we need a ship. 
I'm not going to create, if you were doing this, you could go out and find an interesting model for it. I'm not going to create an interesting model. I'm just going to create a capsule. Um, there it is on the screen. I'm going to make that capsule. Um, we'll do what we did yesterday and create a new material. So if we create um, material, uh, we'll call that ship skin, and we'll make that white just so it stands out on the screen. There we go. So now we don't have a light in our scenes, so we better add a light, create other, we'll make it a directional light so it lights up everything, and we'll move that over there. So if we look down on it from the Y direction, that should now, okay, be a nicely lit, moodily lit um, thing. Let's put that back there. Where's the camera? There's the camera. Okay. So now we should be, there we go. So we're looking, looking down the barrel of the camera. There's our, um, there's our ship in the middle of the screen. <coughs> Excuse me. So, just let me... Mm. Nuts. I had a bottle of water and I put it somewhere. <coughs> so we have a ship. Step one complete. Um, step two, we need to make it move. So um, we've talked before about, okay, so we need to put a, uh, a script on the ship in order to make it move. So let's start, create, a, uh, create JavaScript. Uh, we call this, uh, let's call this ship control. Um, sounds like a good name for, for it and open it up in a thing. So now, um, so we've opened a standard empty script. Um, it has a single function called update, um, which is going to control our ship. So if I come back here, I've forgotten, I haven't read these, I prepared these slides for a while ago. We, um, we've talked before about, um, about scripts, obviously. Scripts in, in uh, Unity can be in JavaScript, C Sharp, or Boo. And you see, if you look in that menu, there are options to create scripts in any of those languages. Um, we are only going to touch on JavaScript in this class. Um, if you want to learn about any of these others, uh, you, can, uh, look, uh, you can look them up in your own time. Um, every, every script defines what's called a behavior. And a behavior is actually an object. Um, so. Uh, so a script has some, um, so every script has methods and properties like any other object. Um, scripts also inherit behaviors from what's called the mono behavior class. So I won't go into inheritance in detail, um, but if we have a look at, at the mono behavior um, in the script reference, hopefully my internet is working. Actually, no, let's, let's do it like this. Let's look it up in here. So then I don't need the internet. Mono behavior. Okay, so if you have a look at the mono behavior class, all of, all of this is actually on any script. It's part of any script you make. So every script you make, for example, has, um, has all of these functions attached to it and has a number of uh, inherited members or variables. So all of these variables that are listed here as part of the mono behavior class are also variables on your behavior script. Um, so we talked previously about how there's a, if we look here, there's a transform, um, there's a transform variable here. So I talked on Monday about how you can use that transform variable in order to access, um, in order to access the transform on the current object. There's a whole bunch of other, other things here. Some of them have no meaning on, uh, on most things. For example, if you're, um, if you're adding the script to a light, the light, uh, there's a light variable which will tell, which will, give you access to the, the light properties of that object. If the, if the object that you're adding the script to isn't a light, that variable will, will um, have no meaning and you won't want to use it. Um, there are other, other things here. Most of them you won't want to deal with, um, but some of these things are important. The thing we should see up here is in the list of overridable functions. They're functions that there already exists a version on there, but they're there for you to override them with your own versions of these functions. And the first one on the list is the update function. So every, every behavior has a built-in update function, and that update function normally does nothing. Um, but you can write your own update function to override that do nothing function. 
Um, there are a whole bunch of other scripts here. We won't look into all of them, um, well, for starters, but ones you won't want to know about, there's the start script, there's a start method at least, which runs only once when, you're, when your code is first run. And there's a whole bunch of um, what are called event handler methods here. All of these do nothing by default. Um, it's just, they're just there for you to uh, write your own versions of them. Some of them we'll look at later for handling mouse clicks on things. These, these events are how we respond to when the user clicks on it. Some of them we'll look at for how to handle collisions. And there'll be some methods that we'll implement when a collision happens. A lot of them we don't care about at all. So we won't, um, don't need to worry about. So coming back to wherever we hit our keynote. Um, so Unity is an event-based programming environment, um, which means that uh, usually when you write a, co uh, a program in, an, in, another, in another platform, you'll just give a list of instructions and your program will start executing those instructions at the beginning and keep going until it gets to the end. Unity doesn't quite work like that. Um, what Unity does is provide, provide you with a whole bunch of events. They're things that happen in the program and then you write methods that respond to those events. Um, so an example of an event is when the user clicks on something. And then when the user clicks on something, um, the, there, is an, uh, there is a method that you define which, which handles what to, ha what to do when that event happens. So, so, you, so your scripts contain methods that are called event handlers, which tell, the, tell Unity how to, what to do on each of those events. Um, the methods are usually named after the event they handle. So the main ones that we'll want to think about are start handles the event that the program has started. So that's an event that happens only once. As soon as the program starts, the start method on, your, on any of your scripts will be called. The update method happens on every frame. So that's an event that happens every time that Unity re-renders the scene, it calls update on, on, on your thing. Um, the on mouse down is an event that happens when the user presses a mouse, uh, uh, clicks the mouse on an object. And then you're, and it calls that method, and that method does whatever is necessary to handle the mouse click. And the one we'll be looking at later, in order to handle collisions in uh, in asteroids, is on Uga enter, which is when one object collides with another. You can see all of those and more in the in the in the description for mono behavior. So the most important ones are the start and update. Um, the first start initializes anything that needs to be set up the first time you run your script. And then update makes changes from frame to frame. Um, so we're going to write. So, um, so an example of this is if we want to initialize the position of an object um, to a certain location, um, we can set that position uh, in the start. So as soon as the program starts, the object automatically moves to that location. And then we've already written update methods before, which do which happen on every frame will move 0.1 per frame, which is then just simple call to translate to, to move 0.1 per frame. So this runs once and once only. This runs every frame, which means about 30 or 40 times a second this code gets run again and again and again. If we, uh, oh, well, there we are. If we wanted to um, translate and rotate, we could translate by that much and then rotate by that much. Um, that's not really exciting. Oh, well, that's interesting. Okay, so this is something worth worth knowing about, um, and that's interesting because that's different to what we talked about before. Okay, um, actually, this is something I'm going to need to draw on the board because because I don't have any chalk because because um, I didn't prepare a slide to talk about this. We said that everything has a position in the world. So this is, let's just, just talk about 2D for the time being. This is our world, right? And, every, and our object has a position in there which is a certain position x, y. Right? And I said that when you move an object, you, trans, you have a vector which points in the world and you translate it by that much. Um, and that moves it to another position in the world. Now. That's fine if you use, if you did what I said before, when you have transform dot position 
plus equals vec uh, some vector v, right? So if this is v, um, we move from, then it takes our position in the world there and moves us to our position in the world over there. That works fine. Now, I told you a lie in a previous lecture. It wasn't a deliberate lie. I didn't, un I didn't know that it was different. Um, I said that that's the same as doing translate, uh, transform, sorry, dot translate v. And I said that those two things were the same. That's not entirely true. Um, and the difference is that, um, that when you rotate an object, this will still move it in the world's coordinates, this will move it in the object's coordinates. Now this is, this is a bit weird. So when I, if my object is initially, every object has its own coordinate frame, which is, um, if you look at the object in Unity, when you click on it, it has a little set of axes, axes attached to it. Right. Um, normally those axes are lined up the same as the world's axes and so, um, and so the, the object's x-axis is lined up with the, with the world's x and the object's y is parallel to the, the world's y. When you rotate an object this changes. So when I rotate this object um, its axes move and so where before, if I rotate it clockwise um, then its x-axis might now point up that way and its y-axis now point up that way, right? Now, the tricky thing now is if I, if I use this code to, to move something by a vector, it'll move it by that vector in, in world coordinates. But if I use this code, it'll move it in its, in its local coordinates, um, which means that if I say, for example, um, if my vector is, uh, is vector 1, 0, right, which is the vector that's parallel to the x-axis, then if I use this code, it'll move, move to there, right, it'll move 1 in the world's coordinates. If I use this code, it'll move 1 in the object's coordinates, which will move it that way, because it's parallel to this x-axis. This, this is something slightly weird to get your head around. Every object has its own coordinates. The good thing about this is it means that I, don't, I can tell this object to move forwards and it doesn't matter which way the object is rotated, it will move forwards, it will move in its x direction. So, um, so I don't have to say, okay, if I wanted the, the object, so if this object is my spacecraft, right, which looks like that. If I wanted to if I was working in the world coordinates and I wanted to move that object forwards one, one metre, I'd have to work out, I'd have to take a vector that was one metre long, rotate it so that it was pointing in the same direction as the, uh, as the ship and then add that vector onto here. Um, but the good thing is about translate is it does that rotation for me and so it automatically, see so if I say move one in the x direction, it will move one that way automatically because it moves in the local coordinates of the object, not in the global coordinates of the space. Um, this can be re really confusing, but all it means is that every object has its own coordinate system. So if you think about it, um, if we had a world coordinate system which said, like, again, the, 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 that corner of the room was zero, zero, then my local coordinate system is lined up with that coordinate system and that, for me, the, the two axes are like that. But your local coordinate system is the other way around. For you, the, the axes are like that, right? Because you're facing the opposite direction. So anytime I tell, if, if I was moving in the world's coordinates, I would say move one meter uh, in, the, in whatever direction that is. What direction is that? East? South? I don't know. Move one meter. So if I said, move, let's call that, what direction is that? Which way are we facing on campus? Eh, that's south, isn't it? I'm going to say it's south. It's going to be south for today. Okay, so if I told you move one, one meter, oh shush. Oh, it's my mother. Hi, mom. I, no, I'm in the middle of a class. They're all looking at me and laughing. Right, bye, mom. I'm going out, it's my birthday this week and we're going out to dinner and mom, but anyway. Um, but that's, that's nothing to do with it. So if I told you move one meter north, um, we're going to call that north now because, you know, let's just call it north. Um, then you, that's in one meter in the world's coordinates and so you'd move that way. On, to, on the other hand, if I told you to move one meter forwards, 
then that's one meter in your own coordinates, which would be, um, you know, whichever way you're facing would, would depend. So um, you've got to, yeah, so remember, every object has its own coordinate system, and, um, and so how you turn it around will change its local coordinate system. But really, is, it's just which way is it facing. And, um, and the x direction, the x, y, and z will be up, down, well, actually, it will be, the x will usually be right in its coordinate system, the, uh, the z will be forwards, and the y will be up, right? So if I told you to move one meter x, it would probably be moved that way. If I told you to move one meter y, you'd go up that way, which is a bit tricky. And then one meter z, you'd move that way, right? But that's completely can be completely independent of the world's coordinates. This can get really freaky when you attach objects to other objects, um, because if I, for example, um, if I attach the camera to this, right? Um, so I have the camera attached here, which is nicely always looking at my ship. Now the camera has its own coordinates frame there. Uh, actually, the camera's coordinates frame will be, will be like that, right? Um, probably the camera will be pointing down that way and out that way. Um, now the camera's coordinate frame will rotate with the ship. So if I rotate the ship, the camera will, will rotate. And the camera has its own coordinates frame. And if I told the camera to move um, negative z, it would pull out that way. And if I told it to move positive z, it would move in that way. So every object has its own coordinates frame. It actually, it's a bit difficult to wrap your brain around at the beginning, but it actually turns out to be really easy because it means that you don't have to worry about which way things are facing. If I tell it to move forwards, it always moves forwards, uh, whatever way it's facing. Um, if you don't do this, you have to do an awful lot of convoluted thinking, saying, okay, when I say one meter forwards, I actually mean one meter forwards. I've got to rotate it by the amount the ship's rotated, then I've got to rotate it by the amount the camera's rotated, and, and then it ends up being, and inevitably get that wrong. Um, oh, I know I do. Um, so the good thing is everything happens in its own local coordinate frame. And so you just say to the camera, move, pull back one meter, and it does. And it doesn't matter how, which way it's oriented, it doesn't matter where the ship is, and it doesn't matter where the camera is according to the ship, it just moves backwards one meter. Um, so if you do this, you move in world coordinates. If you do this, you move in self coordinates. Um, if you want, if we go and look at at, at the uh, docks again, where we were. Um, if we go back and look at transform again, wherever I put it. Transform. Uh, transform. If you look at, tran at that method, translate. Uh, yeah, this is the one. Translate a vector. It, has, it also has this second argument. Let me zoom in on that. If, we, if I can, I've got now to do it. Yeah, there we go. So transform actually takes two, two uh, inputs. One is the vector. The other one is this relative to thing. And by having equal space self, it means that the default is that it's going to be relative to itself. So if you don't specify a space, then it'll just move in its in itself space. You can actually specify space dot world as an alternative if you want to use translate in world coordinates. But most of the time you won't. You'll just want to use translate in, in its own local coordinates. So, so that was something that I uh, should have told you before. Anyway, um, so let's actually get down to using this. So if we want the ship um, to move, let's, we, the first thing we can do is say, okay, um, we won't, so we can just do transform.translate um, and we can use vec there's a handy short shortcut. Um, we can use vector three dot forward as a, a shorthand for um, for the forwards vector in what. Um, and now, hopefully, depending on which way forwards is in our world, forwards is probably actually we can check that out. If we look at go back here, um, if we go to vector go to vector three. We have a look at where is it? It should have forwards here somewhere. Forward, there it is. Oh, it's forward, no S. Forward is in the Z direction, right? So it's zero, zero, one. So I got a so it's vector three dot forwards. Oh, my phone's beeping at me. Um, 
So the z direction, actually we don't want it in, to move in the z direction, we want to move it along this axis, the y axis. Um, so we're going to not use forwards, we're actually going to make it move up because that's the right direction for our world. And now if we attach that control, yeah, go away, I'm running out of time. So if we attach that ship control to our, our capsule, there we go, it moves up, lovely. Um, now, we don't want it to move up at that particular speed, so what we can actually say is uh, we can control the speed by adding a speed, which is a float, and we'll scale that vector by our speed. Right, and we can give this a, uh, a default value. Um, the default value might be 0 0.1. Okay, so now if we run that, there's no syntax error, so we run that, it doesn't move at all. Yay, because what did I do wrong? Um, so if we select our ship, uh, oh, our speed is zero. Okay, let's try that again, 0 0.1. Now that's sort of, that's a bit rough, but that'll do. Um, I want to get on to what, this, let's just change that around, not that view, this view. Just move the camera back a little bit. Okay. Beautiful. Right, so we've got a ship that moves that's not very exciting on its own. But the nice thing about this is now, if we come, um, if I, like I said before, if we come back to this view, what view am I looking for? That view. If I take the ship now and rotate it, like that. Oops, no, rotate it, come on. What are you doing? Rotate, there we go, rotated. Now if we play, the ship moves that way. So the ship's moving in its own coordinate frame and we can, we can rotate that coordinate frame whichever way we want and the ship will move in that direction. Okay. Um, so now what I want to do is actually make this respond to a key press. Um, so I'm going to cut, cut to the chase and um, the way that, we, way that we can tell whether someone is pressing a key is if we have a look in, in here, there's a method, there's a class called input, and it has a whole bunch of methods, but one of the methods it has is get key. Um, and it says here that get key returns true when the user holds down a key identified by name. Um, so, that, what does that mean? Hmm, that's, so let's go back here. Um, so we talked about how, so we've got methods. The general syntax for a method, so the update method is an event handler that does it. The general syntax for a method, which you probably already encountered, is you have func the keyword function, the name of the method, and then in braces, a list of statements that are, that are executed in order. Um, the update, so we had the update event happens on every frame of the animation. Um, we've already looked at that. So, what I want to get onto, um, yeah, we've talked about that before. We've talked about assigning variables before. Um, what I want to do is, okay, so this is what I want to get onto. Um, we, I might go back and look at some of those other details later. Um, we talked about having, having types and, um, and different types of data. And one of the things that I said before is that, you know, we looked at the types which were ints and floats and strings, there's another type of data which is just a value that is either true or false. And this is a Boolean, it's called, after George Boole who invented it. Um, you wouldn't think you'd have to invent true or false, but he did. Um, so a Boolean is a, is, a, is a way that we test some condition in the world and see whether it's true. Boolean expressions are, way, are are expressions that express whether or not, expressions that express, that's, yeah. they're ways of doing some sort of test on a variable, seeing whether it's true. So the expression x is less than zero tests whether the variable x is less than zero and returns true if it is and, zero, and, and false if it isn't. So this is a value that's either true or false and it'll be true when x is less negative and false when it's zero or more. This is, um, this is the same, it's a different uh, Boolean expression we use greater than or equal to and, um, and it tests whether it's greater than or equal to some value. The uh, last thing here is this is the, to test whether something is equal to a value, we use double equal sign. Um, 
because we use the single equal sign for, for assignment, we'll use double equal sign in order to test for equality. It's very important that you use, that you make sure you use the single equal sign when you do assignment and the double equal sign when you want to test for, for equality. Um, there are a whole bunch of them. I'll go into them in more detail. But what I want to get to is this. When we have one of these values, we can then use the if statement, the conditional statement, to test whether it's true or false. And if it is true, we can run, the if statement will run some code. And if it isn't true, then we won't run that code. Um, so this is a way of letting us put branches in our codes to see, see whether something is true in the world and, and respond to it appropriately. Um, so in this case, what we wanted to say is if the user is pressing the, uh, pressing the up arrow key, then we'll move the ship forwards. Otherwise, we won't move the ship forwards. Right. So now we've got a branch in our code that the ship, the we code will do two different things based on some condition in the world. So um, we'll look at that later. Um, so this is probably jumping through too many things at the same time, but never mind. Get key um, gives us a boolean result. It tells us whether or not someone is pressing a key. So if we want to, so what we can do is this: if input dot get key up so again again we're using the braces everything within the braces is part executes if the if the if the condition is true everything if otherwise it just skips to the end after the braces so the braces are used to to gather together bodies of code um, so the, the, we use braces here to gather together the body of the, uh, the method and then we use braces here to gather together the body of the if statement and we're grouping code together into a single, a single unit. Um, so if we take that code now, then what we play that, okay, nothing happens. And nothing happens because I'm not pressing any keys, right? So if we look at the code, it, it, we, every time we update, if input.getKey is false because I'm not pressing the up key, um, and therefore it skips to the end of the code and does nothing. Um, and so at the moment, nothing is happening. But when I press the up key, if I, I hope I got this right, hey, the ship moves. Wonderful. There we go. And it moves off the screen because we haven't got anything to do about that. And I can't bring it back because I didn't make any commands to turn it around or otherwise. Um, but the, the, basic, the basic control work can work like that. So we have a way of telling whether a user is pressing a key. It tells us, it gives us a value either true or false. Um, depending on whether the key is down. And if the key is down, we could do something. If the key isn't down, well, well, if the key isn't down, we normally skip. But what we have also is the ability to do um, an else statement. The else, so if we have if, and then we have the, in the braces, we have the things we do if it's true. Then we have an else uh, part. The else, the things in the braces here, or we'll, what we'll do if it's false. So what we can do if we want is we can say if the key is down, the up key is down, we'll, we'll move forwards. Else, so otherwise, um, we might do something else. So we might do if the key isn't down, we'll move in the other direction. So we can say move negative, well, I keep using the wrong key there, negative vector 3. So now when we run, whoops, let's restart and run. The ship will move backwards while I'm not pressing a key. And when I do press the ship will move forwards. And when I release the key, the ship moves backwards again. And so, so our code does one thing when the, key is, when the key is down and another thing when the key is up. So, and we're just about out of time, so I won't be able to show you much more than that. But what you'll be doing in today's tute is extending this, uh, this code to move an object around in the world using, using up, down, left, and right. Um, and so what I want you to, uh, so you can use input get key, you just say the name of the key is what you put in here and it'll give you true if the, ob if the key's being pressed and false if it doesn't. So if you want to see whether they're pressing the down key, then you'll say if input dot get key down. And if you want to press the left key, it's input dot left key left. And so I get key left. All right. So I'm going to leave it there and you have an opportunity to mess around with this in, uh, in shoots this week. Um, the other thing to notice though is that before you go, assignment one is out.
And if I had access to the internet, I'd be able to show it to you. Um, but my internet is not working today. So if you have a look at the web page, assignment one is out. Your task in assignment one will be to make a very simple flight simulator. Um, so you have a plane model, you'll have a world. Um, I want you to use the arrow keys to fly through the world. And in particular, what I want is the, sh the airplane just moves forwards of its own accord, but I want you to uh, use, the, use the arrow keys to, to uh, pitch the plane and roll the plane. Um, so if you press up, the, 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 the plane will do a loop-the-loop. -loop. If you press uh, down, the, the plane will loop that way. And if you, press, if you roll, you'll do a barrel roll. Um, and then you, you can use those together to, to move around the world, because if you roll the ship that way and then, then pitch, you'll actually turn that way, then that way, and you'll be able to turn a right angle. So then you'll get kind of a flying kind of behavior. So you got to implement, so what I want is in next week's lab, and for the mundane people, I mean the week after's lab. I mean, so in the, not the week, not the lab that you're doing in the next week, but the lab you're doing after that. Um, I want you to do it, hand in a storyboard of your, of how your world's going to look like. And then in the, and then in the end of week five, then Sunday at the end of week five, you're going to be submitting your assignment. There's going to be inst instructions for how you can submit it online. I haven't put them up yet. But first thing you need to do is just do a storyboard for what it's going to look like. Um, and then, then you can and read through the rest of the instructions. If you have any questions on the assignment, um, feel free to email me or, um, yeah, and I will, I will endeavour to answer them. All right, thank you all for coming. That was a bit rushed, but I hopefully we got the idea. I'll see you later.